You are watching Lifeline, a production of Lifeline Media and United Christian Fellowship of Arlington. Enjoy and be blessed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sparing our lives to see yet another day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you and to come together virtually and in person to study your word. We pray, Father God, that you would grant us grace, that you would grant us spiritual wisdom, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of the word. We pray for the spirit of understanding and the spirit of discernment so that as we hear the word, that we would make application into our very lives and making application, Father God, that we would find victory like the word of God says in Psalm um, number 119. It says, wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? Then it goes on to say that it is according to your word, O Lord. So we know, Heavenly Father, that it is by your way, by your word, that our paths will be made straight. And we pray, O Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, grant us understanding that our crooked paths will be made straight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today's Bible study is taken from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. I will read from the New King James Version of the Bible. And it says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven Give good things to those who ask him. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Amen. Amen. I just read to us now Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 14 from the New King James Version of the Holy Bible. Again, those of you who are studying along with us, this passage of scripture is a continuation of Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount. In this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught his disciples the principles of life in the kingdom of God. 
and as a way of teaching, what he did was he began to contrast life in the kingdom of God from life in the kingdom of men as the disciples and the people of Israel already knew it. So Jesus began to teach them based on what they already knew. They were already familiar um, with life in the kingdom of men as it was evidenced in the rule of the, of this, um, the religious rulers, the scribes and the Pharisees, the political rulers of the day, Herod and the like. The disciples were familiar with this. And it is because of this that Jesus started with the familiar before teaching them about the unfamiliar. In fact, he used the things that they already understood to teach them about the things that they did not understand. He made it clear to them that there are two different kingdoms that are pulling or struggling, as it were, for the souls of men or for authority over humankind. One of those kingdoms is what we would call the kingdom of men or uh, the way of life as men see it. And the other is the kingdom of God that is guided by the principles, the spiritual principles set forth by our Lord. This is the situation in which we all live today. We still live in a situation where we are pulled between these two kingdoms. And much of this Sermon of the Mount has been spent teaching us how to discern between the two kingdoms and um, how to walk in victory according to the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of men. Today's text, Jesus points out three, um, deals with three primary subjects. He talks about the question of judging or judgment. Secondly, he talks about asking, seeking, and knocking. And ultimately, he talks about a narrow way and a broad way. These are the three um, sub-themes, if you will, that are covered in today's lesson. First of all, beginning in verse 1, all the way to verse 6, Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. So this is the first thing we're going to deal with today, this question of judgment. All of us, um, or at least many of us who are Christians, and those of us who have been in some kind of leadership role in the church, or we have been in the church for a decent amount of time, we have all heard people express this issue of judgment. Nobody can judge me. 
judge not. Don't judge me. On and on and on. So we are fa quite familiar with this saying or this sentiment being expressed by people. But tonight we want to take a look at what did Jesus mean when he talked about this issue of judgment, when he taught his disciples not to judge? Well, we'll see a few things there that he um, addresses. Whatever this judgment may be, he said, be careful um, about how you exercise it. In fact, he said, refrain from doing it so that you may not be judged in like manner. He says, for whatever judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. In other words, refrain from judging because the standard that you use to judge others is a standard, is the standard that is going to be used to judge you. And then Jesus presents a, the challenge of this judgment. He says to them, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? The point that Jesus is making here is that your brother has a speck in his eye and you have a plank in your eye, which means that both of you, both you and your brother, have something in your eye. In this case, Jesus says that um, you both have something in your eye, but he speaks here to the fact that what is in your eye may be bigger than what is in your brother's eye. And then he says, be careful when you begin to judge your brother and say you want to remove the speck in his eye. I believe that this statement by Jesus may have uh, been occasioned by the fact that he grew up in a carpenter's shop. As somebody who grew up in a carpenter's shop, he was familiar with how to cut pieces of wood, and it is very easy to get specks of that wood to enter into your eye. And then, of course, he was familiar with the idea of planks or pieces of wood lying all over the place. So Jesus uses this as an, an, an analogy to teach a very important principle. He said, you have something in your eye, which he describes as a plank. Your brother has something in his eye, which he describes as a speck. But the truth of the matter is that both of you have something in your eye. And I know that when you have something in your eye, whether it is a plank or a speck, you cannot see properly. Have you ever had sometimes even a little piece of hair or say maybe your own eyelashes? Just a little strand, one strand of your eyelash. Have you ever had that enter into your eye? And then when it enters into your eye, your eyes become so watery, you cannot even keep your eye open till you somehow remove that speck. So imagine if you were to have a speck, like a little piece of wood in your eye, how difficult it is to see. In fact, it would be impossible to see even with that speck. How much more if a person has a plank in his eye. Surely for such a person now, um, sight of any kind will be impossible. And Jesus Christ in verse 5, he talked about the people who are focusing on what in the other, is in the other person's eye. And he called them hypocrites. Matthew chapter 7 
um, verse 5. He says that those who are focusing on what is on other people's eyes are hypocrites. And we have already learned throughout the course of our study of um, the Sermon on the Mount that when Jesus was talking about hypocrites, he was talking about the religious leaders, specifically the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus was in essence saying to the scribes and the Pharisees that you are busy um, judging all the other people without realizing that the problem you have, the spiritual problem you have, is even way worse than the people that you are trying to correct. He says to them, in essence, remove the plank from your own eye. Deal with the big issue that is in front of you. When a person has a plank in his eye, the person is literally blind. But if a person has a speck in his eye, their eyes may be watery, they may have to shut their eyes, it may be tough, but they can still see a little bit. But if you have a plank in your eye, it means that you are in total blindness. And Jesus Christ says to these religious leaders, he says, remove the plank in your eye. Deal with your own spiritual blindness before you will be able to deal with uh, what is ailing another person. And then he goes on to say, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. One of the questions that we asked concerning today's um, lesson is this. It says in verse 1, Jesus taught his disciples not to judge others. What does it mean to judge others in this context? What is the problem with judging others? And what are some common ways that Christians tend to judge others today? So let us begin with the first question. It says, what does it mean to judge others in this context? Let us um, get clarification um, concerning online um, responses. Do we have any today? Um, no, there were no online. Okay, so we don't have any um, thoughts sent online. So let us deal with it from with those that are in-house today. Jesus is talking about this issue of judge or judging. So the question is, what does it mean to judge in this particular context? You know, um, in the common use of the word judge, a judge, you may use the word judge as a noun. If it is used as a noun, it is talking about a person who sits um, and presides over a legal proceeding. That is a judge. You may use the word as a noun. But you may also use the word judge as a verb. As a verb, which means an act. Uh, something that is being done. And if you use the word judge as, uh, as a verb, look at it as a verb, to judge a person or a thing is to determine the quality or the authenticity or the truth of that person or thing based on evidence. To determine the quality, um, the authenticity or truth of that person or thing based on weighing of evidence. And in a judicial sense, it will be to judge a person is to determine the person's guilt or innocence regarding a charge or allegation against them. So these are common usages um, of the word judge. First of all, as a noun, referring to a person. 
presiding over a judici judicial proceeding, and secondly, as a verb, talking about this issue of determining the quality, the truth, the guilt, or the innocence of a person or a thing. So, in this our text, when Jesus says, judge not, that you be not judged. Anybody want to help us? What is he saying here regarding judge? What is the meaning of this judge, this word judge, as it is used in this particular context? Reverend Aleda is going to share with us. I, I, I think here the Bible is calling us not to blame or to um, condemn, but just to reach out to people uh, in form of, uh, if I may use the word grace, not showing yourself as you have, you know, arrived and not, um, I think that is the best way I can put it. Don't go with the attitude of blaming or condemning uh, uh, people or putting people down because of whatever they have done. Amen. I think that is um, that's a great um, answer, Reverend. Um, you have used um, a couple of words that we, key words in your response, the word blame, the word condemn, and the word grace. Um, these are some thoughts. Do we have any other contribution? Or, but, Tony, are we good with that? Okay, let us, um, when Jesus says, do not judge, uh, what does it mean to judge others here? I think Reverend pretty, pretty much uh, spoke my thought. But what I could I just add is uh, the, the instance of George meaning you yourself acting as if you are more righteous than the person that you are judging. You know, I, the case in point was uh, the, the woman who was caught in adultery, you know, brought to Jesus. And uh, Jesus said, well, uh, you know, they, they were saying, hey, the law says this is what we should do to somebody who is found committing this crime. But Jesus himself, in a, in a very nice way, told them that, well, if any of you is without sin, go ahead, condemn her. So this judging, meaning when you judge, because if you go further, I say, because with the measure you use, to judge others, that's how they're going to judge you. So whenever you are doing this, you have to be doing it in the way not to say that you are more righteous than the person that you are judging. Amen. Amen. These are great answers, and these are the answers. In this particular text, that word judge that is being used is talking about condemnation. Don't condemn people. It doesn't mean that you should not consider people or you should not consider things. We as Christians, every day of our Christian lives, we are called to consider things, to consider the quality of things. That is why the Bible says, for example, you shall know the truth and the truth shall what? Make you free. It means that we are to consider things to know whether they are true or false, uh, to know whether they are good or evil. The Bible says in Galatians chapter, chapter 5, well, it is telling us about the, um, the fruit of the Spirit. He said the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all of these things. In order to appreciate these things, there must be judgment. That is judgment in the sense of considering one thing against the other. To be able to discern what is good and what is evil. This is not what Jesus is telling us not to do. Because as Christians, 
we must do that every day. So if a person tells you, don't judge me, don't because I'm doing something wrong, you cannot correct me. That is not what this is saying. We Christians ought to be able to discern between what is good and evil. And not only should we be able to discern, we should also be able to communicate that to others as needed, as part of our Christian responsibility. What Christ is telling us not to do here is not to condemn. Don't condemn people. Because number one thing, you don't know the fact of every circumstance concerning the people that you are dealing with. You don't know all of those facts. And when you condemn people um, without knowing the whole truth, you put yourself again in danger because this is what the Lord is saying. Be careful how you judge because you will also be judged in the same way. So let us be, um, let us be mindful about that. It is about condemnation. And what Christ is teaching us is that if we are going to make judgments about things, or if we want to make those kinds of decisions, we should do what Reverend Eleda talked about. He spoke about the word grace. Because if you read in the text, you find out both the person that is judging and the person that is being judged are both sinners. You get it? Because both of them have something in their eyes. Both of them are falling short. So when we judge others as if there is nothing in our own eyes, then we are deceiving ourselves. But rather, when we judge others, we should deal with others with mercy. I was just um, today, very interesting circumstance. I will not go um, into names. But um, a few weeks ago, about a month ago, I reached out to somebody about a situation. And um, I needed some help with a personal matter. And so I reached out to somebody. And the person, graciously, the person I attended, you know, talked to me about, you know, the things we needed. And then they did what they could and all of that. It wasn't until today, um, almost a month later, that I found out that even when that person was doing what they were doing for uh, me or what they were trying to do, I found out that the person was even dealing at that time with the death of their own mom. <laughs> you know? But the, um, no, not that the mom had passed, but they were dealing with some pretty serious issues concerning the mom that ultimately led to the mom's death. But when I was talking to the person, the person never told me that this is what is happening in his or her own life. What is the point? That if you jump and you make a judgment, oh, this person did this, this person didn't do that. You don't even know the circumstances many of the time. So we should be careful about that. And he says, what is the pro other question? What is the problem with judging others? First of all, we are all sinners. Uh, or we all commit sin. Let me put it like that. And secondly, if we don't apply grace, like Reverend Eleda said, if you are that gracious in your dealings with others, then don't expect others to be gracious in their dealings with you. Like is commonly said, what goes around comes around. Another thing that we see in the text here is that the person with the plank in their eye, who is totally blind, apparently he still manages to see the listing in the next person's eye. What does that mean? Letting us know that it is easier to see something in another person 
than to see it in your own self. Is that right? It is always easier to see something in another person, your brother, your sister, anybody else, area where they are falling short. But many times when it comes to our own area of falling short, we have explanations or justifications. And these things are all very, very problematic because they can cloud our judgment. We can, it's like the mother, uh, the, 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 the story is, is said about a mother who went to a high school parade. They, they were having a marching band in the high school and her child was part of the marching band. And all the children in the marching band were marching in a particular way. Only her child was marching, marching differently. Then she would turn around and told a friend, you see, I told you my child is the only one who is correct. <laughs> only my child knows how to march. Not figuring out that everybody, there are more than 200 people in this, ba in this band, all of them are marching one way. Her child is doing something else. She never figures out that maybe there's something wrong with my child. She went and told her friends that uh, all these children in this band, they don't know how to batch, only my child. So let us um, be mindful about that. That is one thing, um, question one, about this thing about judgment. Then the other question we asked is, uh, what are some of the common ways that Christians tend to judge others today? And we have already concluded that judgment in this area is talking about condemnation. What are some of the ways, um, do we have the mic out? You, what are some of the ways um, that we tend to judge others today or condemn others? If we have thoughts, you can bring it up. But have you noticed that we as Christians are quite good at classifying our sins. We put them in different categories. The sins that we are committing are minor ones. The ones that other people are committing are the most egregious ones. And sometimes we say, think that some people deserve to go to hell, whereas we deserve to go to heaven. We have to be careful um, about those things. Are uh, there some ways that um, we do that as Christians today? Yes. And we don't need to go into all of them, but there are ways in which we tend to categorize sins. And some sins, we regard them as more serious than others, but we ignore the sins that pertain to us. May God um, give us grace um, in those areas that we would be gracious in our dealings with one another. Today when Reverend Usanga was um, leading us in prayer, he led us in prayer concerning the issue of mercy that God would deal with us mercifully. That we should pray for the mercy of God in, in the event that we fall short that God should show us mercy. So um, those are some thoughts. Let us just move on maybe to some other questions, then we'll deal with those as well. It says, uh, look at verse uh, number two. The second question that we put out says that in verse six, Jesus taught his disciples not to give what is holy to the dogs. What does it mean for something to be holy? And who are the ones that Jesus describes as dogs in this verse? Is preaching. He says, don't give what is holy to the dogs. What is, when we say something is holy, what do we mean? What does it mean for something to be holy? And again, we, let's put it in the context of here of this message, of Jesus' teaching. He said, don't give what is holy to the dogs. For something to be holy, it means what? That it is separate. Yeah. yeah. 
So a holy thing um, is something that is separate, um, separated for God's use. I think that's what Brother Tony said. Share some other, uh, what would you uh, or what would you say otherwise about something being holy? Yeah, like like I said, this, uh, this sanctuary, this yeah. uh, building, yeah. the building itself is not, uh, you can't move in here and live here as, like, as if it's, it's your house or oh. an apartment. Yeah, yeah. It is a building that is set aside for the use of worship oh. for God. So this is a holy place. Y amen, amen. In, in the context. Amen. So holiness is talking about something that is set apart Something that is set apart unto God, specifically. Sometimes we will use the word um, consecrated. Something that is consecrated unto God. And Jesus in this text is talking to his disciples. He said, do not give what is holy to dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. Now that gives us a little bit of idea because um, of what he's talking about. Because it said something that is separate, separate unto God. Then it describes these things also as pearls that should not be cast before swine. What is a pearl? A pearl is something precious, like a precious stone. So what is Christ telling his disciples here? He said, the things of God, such as the things that he was sharing with them about the kingdom of God, he said, don't cast it before the dog or don't cast it before the swine. In other words, don't take the things that are holy and put them before people who do not care about holy things. Remember, the Pharisees and the scribes were what? Hypocrites. Jesus Christ was sharing with his disciples the truth of the kingdom of God. These are holy things. The word of God. Now you are sharing it with somebody who has no regard. The scribes, the Pharisees. They don't have any regard for the things of God. They cast them under their feet. Even when you teach them the truth of the word of God, they regard it as nothing. They are scornful about the things of God. And I wanted to, uh, when I was studying it, it brought my attention to Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the world, ungodly, or standeth in the way of sinners, or seated in the seat of the scornful. The, the, the scornful are those people, they are not just... Um, uninformed. They are not just people who are spiritually immature, but they are people who disregard the word of God. They trample the word of God, which is a holy thing, under their feet as if it doesn't matter. And Jesus is telling his disciples that the things that are valuable to you, the things that have been set aside um, unto God, the things that are precious, the word of God, the truth of the word of God, these are not things that should be expended with people who have no regard, even for God himself. What are some practical ways that we may see that in our lives today? There are some people who have no regard for um, spiritual things at all. I, there's a person that is um, close to me or known to me, and every time you talk about anything spiritual, he has something de derogatory to say. Anything you tell you talk about God, he, ha he has something derogatory to say, to put it, the things of God down, um, every pastor, as far as he's concerned, he doesn't know you personally, but you are a thief and a this and on and on and on like that. So, 
I have just made up in my mind, even though I know this person, I don't cast my pearl before swine. You know, um, if you are that disregarding of the things of God, that is not where I'm going to spend my energy. If I'm going to spend my energy, let me spend my energy with um, an unbeliever who is seeking God, not the one that you have put, brought the kingdom of God to his doorstep, and he continues to scorn everything about God. So there are those, for example, that are, some people will say they are atheists. And everything you say about God, they have some negative response. The Pharisees and the scribes were like that. They were not atheists, but they were hypocrites. They had formed their own way of worship. And no matter what you told them about the truth, they couldn't care less. Jesus Christ is telling his disciples, the word that you have received is holy. It is something that is precious to you and precious to God. Don't cast it. Don't spend all your energy dealing with those that are scornful of the things of the Spirit. Those people who are genuine seekers, they may not know, they may be un unbelievers at this point, but they are genuinely seeking God. Share the word of God with them. Remember when, what, what did Jesus tell his disciples when he sent them out to preach two by two? Anybody remember that? What, what did he tell them? He said, anybody that doesn't receive you, your feet, I, 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 I move on. So don't spend all your time. Somebody who has rejected Christ, who refuses the truth of Christ when it is delivered to him. Well, you have to move on. Because you can spend so much time concentrating on this person here. And there is a whole world out there waiting to receive the truth of God. I pray that we would embrace this understanding, especially in the issue of evangelism. Because there is a whole world that is waiting to hear um, the gospel of Jesus Christ. While some of us are spending all our time waiting for Mr. A or Mr. B. Don't cast what is holy. Don't give what is holy to the dogs. Don't, don't cast your pearl before swine. That which is valuable to you, they will just trash it and trample it under their feet. So Christ warned his disciples against that. Now let's go to the third question. The third question, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. <coughs> okay. Good. This, um, and it is really not much different. Same concept. In fact, it reinforces the same teaching. The Syrophoenician woman was a woman of mixed race. She was not Jewish. She was not a daughter of Israel, a daughter of Abraham. So they call her Syrophoenician woman because she was a combination. She was both Syrian and Phoenician. So she was not um, a daughter of Abraham per se. So she was not a person. Her people did not believe. Her people were rejectors of the gospel. You understand what I'm saying? Even when Jesus was preaching to them, they were rejectors of the gospel. If you remember, there were some cities that Jesus cursed. What were some of those cities? Um, Tyre, Sidon, and um, there was one other one that, that, they, um, that Jesus cursed because they refused to receive the truth um, of, the word, of the word of God. So these were people, it is consistent. What Jesus is teaching here is consistent with what happened to this woman. 
These were people who had rejected the gospel. Even though the church. But can you see that even when that happened, what did Jesus do? Because this particular Syrophoenician woman, if you remember, when Jesus made that statement to her, what did the woman say? She said, oh, but even the dogs eat the crumbs. So she understood. She wasn't um, denying the fact that her people were unbelievers. But she was saying that in, as I'm coming to you, Lord, can you still show mercy on me? And what did Jesus do for that woman? He showed mercy on her. He showed. The, in other words, even this so-called dog, it wasn't as if Jesus condemned all of them wholesale, particular group. Whoever comes to Jesus by faith, by faith, Jesus will still receive unto himself. But for those who are scornful about the word of God, they regard the word of God as nothing. Don't waste your time getting into arguments with them. Sometimes if you are not careful, your faith may even be negatively affected by interactions with such people. Amen. So, um, good um, question, Brother Tony. And that is a very good connection to make. Now, let us look at um, question number three. This is a good one. It says, in verses 7 to 8 of our text, Jesus teaches his disciples to ask, seek, and knock, and promises that everyone who does these things will receive, find, and have the door open to them. What is Jesus talking about? Does everyone who asks receive? Does everyone who seeks find? Who should be doing the asking? And from whom should we ask? What should we be asking for? So a lot of questions there. But we are all familiar with that passage of scripture. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who receives, who seeks, finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. So Jesus made this statement. Who is he talking to? When he says, ask and you shall receive, and all these things, knock, the door shall be opened, seek, you shall find. Who is he talking to? Believers. Believers. The letter said he's talking to believers. So remember that the text in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus is talking to what? His disciples. He's talking to his disciples. So this is what he's uh, talking about. This asking, these things he's talking about is for believers. So the next question we ask, um, I'm just picking some of them. Who should be doing the asking? Believers. The disciples. Those who trust in God, they are the ones to be doing the asking. Uh, they are the ones to whom this promise is made. So, from whom should we ask? From whom should we ask? From the Lord. And this asking, this seeking, and this knocking that Christ talked about, how do we do it in practical ways? What is our practical way as Christians of asking, of seeking, and knocking? What are some of the ways we do it? Through prayer. Prayer is one of our critical ways, our key ways of asking God. We pray and we ask God. Well, what about seeking? Seeking also through prayer. Um, Reverend Leda, fasting. In other words, sometimes we are seeking from things from God. We learned the other day about fasting and about the power that you can receive from fasting. Sometimes you are seeking. What about this Bible study we are doing? It's all, these are all practical ways that we seek God. And then um, also knocking on the door. 
a person knocking on the door is talking about, uh, knocking on the door is a very good analogy for the expression of faith. Because you only knock on a door when a door is closed. Is that right? It is, well, the idea of knocking on a door is implying that there is a closed door. Then you knock on it and you keep knocking until the door is open. It is an expression of our faith as, we, as believers that when we got to the door, we saw that the door was locked, was locked, but we didn't just turn around because the door was locked and went away. But we kept on knocking. Why? Because we believed that there was somebody behind the door who will open the door. So this promise here is a promise for believers who are asking, who are seeking, who are knocking to receive from God. And it is directed at God. So we need to understand it because it is very easy for people to misinterpret scripture. That is not a promise that is made for everybody. It's not for everybody. It is for those who believe in God and have trusted in him. And in, I believe it is in um, James chapter 1, verse 5, that um, James said, if any of you lack wisdom, is that right? He said, ask God who gives liberally um, and um, upbraids not. So we see these things um, confirmed or affirmed in the word of God. So asking is about praying. Keep praying, keep praying. And then now we come to the last part. The last question there says, what should we be asking for? Thank you, Lord. That last part says, what should we be asking for? What should we be asking for is what? That we are asking what? according to what the will of God. We are asking according to the will of God. When the Bible says, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, all that type of stuff, is not saying that every single thing you open your mouth to tell God you want will happen. No. He's saying that if whatever you ask, in essence, in what? His name. According to the will of God. That is why Jesus said, like we have been discussing here recently, he said, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not by will, but thine be done. And when you really understand what prayer is all about, you will discover that this thing is very true. Ask, you shall receive. Seek, you shall find. Knock, it shall be opened unto you. But what is the caveat? What is the condition? That what you are asking is according to the will of God. One of the things that prayer does for us as Christians, the more we become mature, is that prayer will bring you in line with God's will. Prayer is not a means for you to bring God down to, to be in line with your desire or your will. But prayer is, some, is an exercise of communication between an inferior and a superior. The superior being God. And the inferior now aligning himself to the will of the superior in the course of that conversation. It is critical for us. So many Christians don't understand that about prayer. So we become frustrated when we ask God for A or B and God doesn't grant it to us. Look at the context in which Jesus Christ 
um, even talks about this. He says, Oh, what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, he will give him a serpent? He says, You being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those who ask him? In other words, when you ask of God, trust God that God will do that which is good concerning you. Not for you to insist on, I must have my way. That is a very infantile and an immature way to be a Christian. How many of us have, as Christians have prayed for people, maybe who were sick, and those people that we prayed about still died? Has that happened to us? Does it mean that you don't know how to pray? Does it mean that you are inferior in your prayer life? Do you know any person in their prayer life who will say, in my prayer life, nobody in my family dies? Is there any such person? No. The truth of the matter is that prayer brings us in alignment with the will of God. That is why you see in other parts of the Bible, it says, where two of you shall agree concerning anything in my name, my father will do it. That in my name is referencing the idea that our request should be according to what? The will of God. The, the will of God. Not my will, but thine be done. Now here, even in this country, we are seeing a lot of things now with churches um, who have chosen, some churches have chosen to get themselves all tangled up in the politics of the moment. Is that right? And after so-called prayers and prayers, now something else is playing out before uh, before us as churches and some people are denying reality that is right before our noses. You cannot, we cannot just pray and expect that we are compelling the almighty God to do our bidding. He is God, not us. And no matter, no amount of arm twisting or whatever or gut wrenching is going to change that fact. So we should pray according to the will of God. We should always pray with a mind of subjection that says, not my will, but thine be done. But I like the word of God. Uh, Lord, if you put it up for us, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, maybe round about verse 6. Uh, put, it, put it from verse 4 verse 4 to 6. Philippians chapter 4. If we have it on the screen, you will see in that passage of scripture where the Bible talks about the peace of God that passeth all understanding. He goes on to tell us about that. Go beyond that, 5 and 6. He said, make your request known unto God. Go verse 6. He says, in all things, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be what? Made known unto God. What does this mean? That when you pray, tell God what you want. Tell him the desire of your heart. There's nothing wrong with that. God himself has told us to do it. Tell him your desire, but after you tell him your desire, submit your desire to his own will as almighty God. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine will be done. Don't be presumptuous as if you already know everything about God's will. The truth of the fact is, of the matter is that you do not. 
So let's go to this. Um, let's go to the fourth question, and then we will draw to a close. He said, what does Jesus mean by the law and the prophets in verse 12? Summarize it in five words or less. So let's look at verse 12. It says, therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You will hear that phrase used um, a number of times in scripture, the law and the prophets. What does he mean, first of all, by the law and the prophets? He's talking about all of the Old Testament. So he says, this is the teaching Everything in the Old Testament is what he would refer to here as the law and the prophets. The law being the law given by Moses and the rest of it, the prophets of the Old Testament. So he says, this is the law and the prophets. Look at so much. I'm trying to see how much of the Bible is that in. So much of the That is talking about more than half of this Bible. He says, everything written in this more than half of the Bible, he says that you can summarize it in this thing. He says, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. This is the law and the prophets. And what are some ways we may want to summarize these words that Jesus said? I thought about one way. He said, do unto, uh, no, he said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's a very good summary of it. Love your neighbor. He's saying that everything that is in the Old Testament, you can summarize it in those five words. Love your neighbor as yourself. You don't understand anything else, understand that. And you would have been able to satisfy the law and the prophets. All of the Old Testament boils down to that. And you know Jesus Christ called it the great commandment. Is that right? The commandment of love. He said this is all of the word of God, all of the Old Testament is, su is summarized in this idea of love. Now, okay, let's say three minutes. I want us to be out by 8.45. But I have a question. Let's go ahead and do number five while we're at it. It says, what are the narrow and wide gates that Jesus referred to in verse 13 and 14? Let us read 13 and 14. He said, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So when you think about the context, everything we have been studying in this Sermon on the Mount, what is the narrow gate and what is the wide gate that Christ is talking about? Okay. The way of, sorry. The way of Christ is the narrow, narrow gate. gate. Okay. But the ways of the devil, which is very wide, uh -huh. uh, is the wide gate. And many go through it. You can see even today in the society the believers are few compared to the number of the unbelievers. Amen. Because they go they, they think that what they are doing is right. Yes. So I, I would say, thank you, thank you Reverend Leonard. The, remember Jesus has been throughout the Sermon on the Mount. 
he has been contrasting two kingdoms. Is that right? So now he's bringing the teaching to a head, telling them the narrow gate is what? The kingdom of God. The narrow gate is the one that leads to the kingdom of God. The broad gate with the broad way is the one that is the kingdom of men. That kingdom, the kingdom of men that is dependent on human reasoning, human intellect, and all of that. And majority of people in the world, that is the way they think. When you are a Christian and you go through the narrow gate, which is the difficult gate, when you go through that into the kingdom of God, they look at you while you are making that choice as a person who is not very reasonable. But there is a narrow gate and there is a wide gate. The narrow gate, I think Jesus Christ said about the narrow gate. He says it is the way that leads to life. He's talking about the kingdom um, of God. And then that wide gate is the kingdom of men, the way human beings reason. We think with our intellect. We, we doubt God. We question God. Sometimes we are outright scornful. Oh, there is nothing like God. But the psalmist said that the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. So that gives us a quick review of Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. Next week, when we come back, we are going to go from verse 15 all the way to verse 29. But all of what the Lord is teaching us is about finding this narrow gate, going through this narrow way. And it is the way of life that leads into the kingdom of God. Amen. Now, You've been watching Lifeline, a production of Lifeline Media and United Christian Fellowship of Arlington. We pray you have been blessed. Subscribe to our channel and follow us online for more Christ-filled content. United Christian Fellowship of Arlington is a diverse church for a diverse world. Thanks for watching.